let's move, move on. on. Uh, next, next speaker is uh, a, a professor at our own university, University, Hague Kent university uh, Leonard Martens, and, and he's really into open science. He even uh, started an early data repository some years ago, Pride. I won't say much more about it, but he's an ideal person to talk to you about this. So um, let's uh, give the floor to you, Leonard.
I'm sure this is something that uh, also is very well understood by the EU. Then this is an important one, it's a bit controversial, but if I've learned anything in science, is that data tends to outlive interpretation. This means that actually when you do research, you make a bold statement, your data is much more important than the paper you write about it. Which is the exact opposite of the negative view where we say the data should support the paper. No, the paper is just what you get out of the data. It's an extremely limited view on what you have done. Right? It's a, it's, I'm not saying it's a bad view, but it's limited because you have a particular question in mind, you ask it of the data, you publish it. And there's a lot of data out there today that can do a lot more than just answer that one question that you have, or these few questions. And that is an important thing. Plus, the methods that you have available to yourself today, they could evolve very dramatically over the next few years. Which means that the, the interpretation you make today might look naive in five years' time. Because you have more advanced methods to look at the same data. And the problem is, a lot of people don't want to share data because they feel this and they say, I don't want to share the data because then somebody else can go and mine all the gold I've left behind in my data. Interestingly, from my experience, at least in my domain in the life sciences, nobody ever does that. They're all too busy generating new data. They never go back to the old data. Nobody ever does that. So that is a, but people tend to have an intuitive feeling for this, but it's, it's always a bit harsh when somebody tells you that your data is more important than the beautiful paper you wrote about. Finally, and I think this is the key thing, and this is my, my, my big message, if you remember anything, remember this, open science actually fosters creativity in an unprecedented way. It opens up so many possibilities and so many opportunities that the research that comes out of these kind of things tends to be revolutionary. Because rather than do what everybody else does, take a little bit of data and do something with this, now you have all of this data. And now you can do crazy stuff. You can do things that you would never be able to do on your own. That's where the real problems of this stuff lies. And the, unfortunately, I cannot predict what these crazy things will be. Although I've done a few of them. I'll show you a few examples, but very limited. But you can do really crazy stuff with all of this open access data. And if you are this time, in, uh, up to this moment in time, and you're a young researcher, I think the best you can do is figure out ways on how to make use of this open science, because it will happen. Yeah. When you see that NIH, the EC, everybody's really pushing for this, the Wellcome Trust has been doing this for a long time, the biggest funders in the world are really pushing this, it's just a matter of time before it's everywhere. Now, you cannot even think about fighting this anymore, there's no point. So what we should do is we should really start thinking creatively and say, what can we do, how can we maximize this? You can build an amazing kid, you know. So what does this entail? It's a very brief bit. I don't want to go into too much of the details. The problem is that this is work. And sharing data is not something you do as an aside. The EC also understands this because I now force you, if you're in this pilot, to make a data management plan. So I'm in a few EU projects, and you know, I, I obviously I'm the prime candidate to make data management plans because I'm supposed to know how this works. So I'm actually doing this for a few projects. Now, having said that, I'll be honest, we did not voluntarily enlist in the open data pilot. So we're not in the 11% that did. But we did volunteer to take on all the other requirements. We did promise the data management plan we will make everything available. So it could very well be that we, uh, that we ask the EC at some point to be included in the open data pilot. But we are researchers, we are careful. We say, maybe we'll first have a look at how this goes. If we feel that we're on the right track, then definitely. But we will try to do everything, but we won't promise it in advance. So it's, it's, I'll be honest, that's the way we work. Um, when you submit data anywhere, you have to include metadata. This was also on the slides of uh, the previous speaker. This is very, very important. I'll, I'll show you some examples of how hard it is to get metadata. Second, when you write code, it should be understandable, it should be documented and hosted on a reliable site. I'll show you some examples of what this means, especially in the last bit. This is tricky, and people who write code to process large amounts of data, they tend not to want to document it. Right? I have a lot of these people in my group, and it's really tough. You really have to consider them. It's extra work. But it's extremely important. If you want people to actually make use of what you do, you have to provide context, you have to provide additional information. You should provide all your protocols clearly and in full. And you should say, how did I get this data? Because if somebody else at some point wants to reinterpret the data, if this is missing, then the value of your data is diminished quite dramatically. Because they, they only have a very cursory idea of what the data means. 
If you write beautiful papers, you should always link your interpretations to your data in the public domain. So that when you say this claim is based on that data, that that is obvious and that, it, that this can be verified. This is extremely important, not because everything you do is wrong, but because you may have made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. And a few Nobel Prizes have been awarded to people who actually went after some of these mistakes. And the most famous one is Richard Feynman, who went after a single mistake in a paper that everybody in the field just believed, but he dug deep enough, and then he developed quantum dynamics, or sorry, quantum electron dynamics as a result. So these kind of things, this, this full provenance is extremely important. Also, because it helps other people understand which of your claims, which of your interpretations are valid and how valid they are. So it makes for a stronger foundation for the future of science. And then finally, and this is very often forgotten, that you actually have to think about licenses. You have to give your data, your code, your papers, a license. You have to learn a little bit about this. I don't think we live in a world anymore where you can safely say, I have no clue what a Creative Commons license is. And if you write code, you cannot say, I don't know the difference between a G and a GPL and an Apache 2 license. You cannot live like that anymore. So you really have to know. Fortunately, it takes five minutes of your time to figure this out. Right? But you should figure it out. Right. What we do in practice, this is for one of the EU projects that I'm running now, which is uh, to build an open data exchange, exchange ecosystem for cell migration data, which is something you don't want to think about. And um, the, the idea is that you follow a certain pattern. You have these minimum reporting requirements that tell people how to discuss the data. The minimum reporting requirements are very important, and it could be implemented in the form of a materials and methods section in a paper. It's how you do stuff. You just describe it, well, this is metadata. Controlled vocabularies are ways to make sure that everybody talks the same language. If everybody would use their native language to write the materials and methods section, it would get very, very difficult to interpret other people's protocols. This is the same, only we standardize the words in the English language that we choose to use to describe certain things. And then finally, you need your data and your metadata to be in formats that can be easily readable by computers. So they have to be standardized, they all have to look the same. So that not everybody has their own little type of Excel sheet, or worse yet, PDF document. I used to have this slide where in my field all the supplementary tables with all the proteins that people identified, and there were hundreds, were in all these different PDF documents. And I would just show you all these PDF documents. This is a nightmare, so that is not uh, that is not useful. And then finally it has to go somewhere to live, this data. It has to go to a repository of some renown and of some stability, and I'll get back to that in a second. So I've been writing about metadata. This is my database, existed my database. The database I helped start uh, existed for 10 years, so I made a retrospective. And I looked at metadata. The only thing you want to look at is this. It's the category unknown. This is the instrument, the mass spectrometer, that acquires the mass spectrometry data. It's the most fundamental piece of metadata. It's which thing did you actually put your sample into and the data came out of. That's it. And that's what it is. Unknown, look at this. As the system becomes more popular, more and more unknown data. And then suddenly, boom, turning point. You see that? What is the turning point? There is now a curator who goes through every submitted data set and refuses the data set if it does not say which instrument it is. So why is it declining like this? Because the data gets submitted somewhere here, it takes a while to get published, and this is the publication date. So some of the data. But you see how this completely eradicates the problem? But this is asking people, give us the name of the instrument. It is literally five seconds of work. It's in a graphical user interface where you have to select it from a drop-down list. The worst thing is, when we go around about this time, when there was very little control on this, it turns out that the most often selected instrument is the first one in the drop-down list. There are nine in the drop-down list. It is too much effort to scroll down. Yeah? So this is really problematic. This is a really big issue, and I don't understand why that is. I think people are just irresponsible, because that's the only thing I can, and the only excuse I can think of. Exactly the same when we talk about tissue. This is data that comes from humans or animals. So very often it has a tissue origin. Here you can see how much data comes in, and this is those with annotation, those without annotation. And you see as the data grows, unknown tissue grows until the curator starts. The curator is called Attila. I have now called this the Attila effect. And so the Attila effect kicks in and you see this drop. But isn't this amazing? These are two words. One, two. In a graphical user interface, it's even auto-completing like Google. So you start typing here, for instance, uh, uh, liver. By the time you've got the liver, it's going to give you liver as an option. You just click it. It's too much effort. So this is very, very fundamental. This is 
human engineering. Right? The weakest point in this entire thing is the human who has to do this. It's really strange. Then sharing information effectively is really tricky. We had the question about how do you fund this kind of data availability. Um, the, end, the NIH and CBI actually funded uh, a big repository to compete with the one that I started. They were a few years behind, they got a really big nature biotechnology paper about it, and then the financial crisis hit, and they shut it down. So they literally shut down the repository, and this is the page you see when you go there. And the page is no longer available. Thank God this is the NCBI and not some institutional website maintained by a postdoc. And actually, they do provide everything as a download, here, the FTP download. And the database that I founded, these guys, they actually stepped in. They're here in Europe at the EBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute, and they rescued all the data. They migrated it all to their database, so the data is still there. You can still find it. But this kind of stuff, this is these are Herculean efforts. This is really tricky. This is stuff. This needs fundamental funding at the basic level um, from a whole bunch of countries like the European Commission or from a big country like the US to keep these things operational. This is not cheap and this is a decision that people need to make to fund this. Thank God both NIH and the EU in general fund this quite well. And so we can't really complain. But you have to keep in mind that when you are too lazy to specify your instrument, all of this beautiful money is being thrown in the garbage bin essentially. Right? It's really irresponsible. The same thing can happen to code. So we, for open source code, this is much more popular. This has been popular since the 70s, right? This is Richard Stallman's whole thing. Um, and then all the variants of that. We make all our code freely available. This thing was published in 2015, and it has been open source on the internet since 2011. So we even make it open access before we publish it. Well before we publish it, because we want to publish only strong tools that actually work. So and that takes time. So scooping and this kind of thing does not exist. This project was on Google Code. But then Google Code, which is hosted by Google, they stopped. They just stopped. So we had to migrate everything to GitHub. So thank God Google Code made that easy. So now our page is on GitHub and the old page still links. So, but these kind of things, you know, also take responsibility. You cannot just say, oh, I put it on Google Code and now I run away as fast as I can in the opposite direction. You have to take responsibility for the work you produced and keep half an eye out. And if Google emails you that you might want to migrate to GitHub using these tools, you have to invest a half a day to do that, to keep your stuff alive. Right? Or at least you should enable other people to access your code at the administrator level and do that transition. Because otherwise nothing happens. So unfortunately, we can say open data, open code, is all easy, it is not. You have to invest a bit of time. This is not an endless amount of time, but you have to be aware of it. Anyway, so I've, I've lectured enough about this. Let's, let's have a look at what we can do about this. So this is the database. For those of you who want to know, this is where I left it. Here. So you can see it grew quite dramatically after that. Of course, it's an exponential all the way, right? But it's just flattened because the scale is so close. But you see, this, this is growing pretty well, right? This thing is growing like crazy. Um, and you see two curves here. You see all the data we have. These are mass spectra. You don't even have to know what that is. And we have all of them. And these are the ones we understand, which is only a proportion of everything. So the first thing that my group did was we took this bit and we started doing crazy stuff with that. And without going into any detail, we got a lot of papers out of doing crazy stuff with that. We were among the first in the world to do this. But we really learned a lot. We saw all kinds of crazy patterns in the data. And that's essentially what I'm showing you, crazy patterns. Um, which was really, really useful for us and which really helped the field a lot. And it helped establish my career as a scientist. So again, if you're a young scientist, this is very promising stuff. But this was just the start of it. Then, that's all about the data. I haven't talked about the open code yet, but that's another thing my group benefited from. You see this list of things here? These are all algorithms that are made by other people everywhere in the world. And they're free and open source. And they're search engines. They're the kind of uh, algorithms that take this data, this mass spec data, and transforms it into something we understand. And all these different ones all have different properties. And what we did was we built a tool that joins them all together. And we can do that. We can redistribute all of these tools because they're all free and open source. And our code is free and open source. And this tool, this stupid simple tool, has now become extremely popular. Because it gives everybody in the world, and that includes you if you're so inclined, the ability to download this thing and use all of those tools in a very nice interface. Interestingly, it shows that open stuff allows you to have specialization within the research field. The people who built these algorithms, they are more mathematically inclined and more smart than I am. 
And so they built beautiful algorithms, but they couldn't care less about this kind of interface. They write a command line interface, which you type in a, in a black box, literally a black box. Very few people in my field, the actual wet lab researchers, can, can use these tools. We, however, specialized in making them accessible. And the combination of the two is extremely powerful. These people specialize in the hardcore algorithms, they make beautiful ones. My group, amongst others, specializes in making them available. And together, we work together very closely with all of these people, we can make something that actually works for the field. So this standing on each other's shoulders, it also shows a layer in how these fields can organize. So you can find a niche where previously you had to be a, a person who was able to do everything. So another thing that we did was we built this other tool. It's called Peptide Shake. It doesn't really matter. And it has this Pride reshape. Now, Pride is the name of my database. My database. Database. I, I really have to change my vocabulary around. This is the database I helped found. And so the, this thing, this button, when you click it, when you start the software, you see this. So you click the button, and all of you can do that. If you Google Peptide Shaker, you will find it. Um, you download it, you click that button, you see this. This is all the data in the database with the known metadata. Unfortunately, here is instrument. Very often it will say unknown, as we have seen. Um, and then for each of these data sets, you see the individual files. And then you can select any number of projects and any number of files. And you click this button. And then up pops this screen, where you can select your search engines. And you can reinterpret the data. And it will open up in our evaluation tool. It will apply all kinds of statistics. And it will show you the results. So now, with four or five mouse clicks, anybody in the world can take that data and reanalyze it in any way they see fit. And that is really interesting, because I've showed you this before. Think about this. There is a huge gap between all the data we have and all the data we successfully interpret. In order to close that gap, we need more ways of interpreting this data. And now everybody can do that. Everybody is capable of doing the interpretation. So now, literally, the imagination of the users is the limit. Right? Anybody with a good idea can now test it immediately on the public data. This kind of thing is actually quite rare. So I think in the life sciences, we now have the easiest way of going through the cycle of data. But it does exist in other fields of the life sciences. I think it's, it's, it's also pretty well known in things like ecology. But there are other fields where this is completely not known. But why would it be missing? Why would this not be standard everywhere? And in fact, my students made this graph. This is not something I made. My students made it. But you can see I, I, uh, I was a successful prophet. And they said, the whole point is that when you do an experiment, you interpret it, you generate some knowledge, you publish it, and you put it in a database, in a repository. What can happen is that clever people can now short circuit the cycle. They can skip new experiments because there's so much data already. They can do it purely in the computer. They can take the existing data, reinterpret that, get new knowledge. And you can do this very often because, oops, because of this. So any field where you see the discrepancy between the data you collected and the potential uses you can put it to is a prime candidate for this kind of stuff. It's so trivial. Okay. Now, the way we did that was we built this tool. I'm not going to give you all the technical details, but we spent a lot of time building a tool that can automate this and run this on our cluster so it goes automatically. And we can extract new knowledge. And we've done quite a few interesting experiments. I'll just give you one because it's funny. It's this small open reading frame. Thing. So, you know, the genome, when you have all these genes on the genome, they find the genes with computers. The computers find the genes and say, ah, from here to here there will be a gene. The problem is these very small open reading frames, so very small genes, they are missed because the computer doesn't know what to do with them. So, a colleague of mine here in Ghent University, Herbert Menschmacht, he made a database of all these suspected open reading frames. So, suspected small genes that nobody knows whether they're real or not. And we just took all of these genes and matched them to this database of all the proteins we've ever seen in the mass spectrometer. And whenever this thing gets white or yellow, it means there's a lot of them. And red means there's very few of them. And what you can see is that we find a lot of them. And they seem to be organized by the origin. So in blood, there's different ones than in marrow, say, uh, or in breast. And then unfortunately, there's a lot that are unknown. And you see this lack of metadata come back up. But these are the kind of things that nobody would have deemed possible a few years ago, because in a single experiment, the, the best you can do is find one or two of these. But because we now have tens of thousands, we can literally scan the whole human proteome and look for these kind of weird events. And so we're doing that over and over again, and we're finding lots of amazing stuff this way. And this is extremely useful because it's a direct annotation of the human genome. We're saying from here to here, there's 
an open reading frame that is 99% certain that is expressed or found mostly in blood. This is found mostly in kidney. This is found mostly in breast. And here, some idiot forgot to tell us where it came from. So we don't know. But you see the repercussions of this, right? This, this decision that somebody makes to not spend 20 seconds of their life really has, has effect. So the, the message here is that once you're in the repository, actually, it's not the end. This is not an elephant graveyard. The data comes from there, you should reanalyze, reinterpret, work with that data, and then do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. And show that this data can live. And so, to finish up, this is what happened to me uh, a few years back. A sociologist came and, 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 and researched the way that my group works and the stuff that we did, which was very scary. And they, they read a paper of ours, and they said, she said a few really nice things. She said, such data collections, these are the data collections we were collecting in the database, can be mined for valuable information that could not be obtained in any other way. That's extremely insightful. If you have a compendium of data, it has much more power than an individual data set. It has much more reach. And that is something a few people realize, but you should. Second thing is, and this I, I only include because it's a bit funny, she, she said, this is a way to reactivate sedimented data. It's a very colorful way of saying things. If you've ever been to a water treatment plant where they sediment the, the, the filth out, seriously, you only don't want to be there. It's the worst place in the world. Uh, and so reactivating sedimented data, I don't know, it doesn't look good, but it's true. So the data sinks down and we reactivate it. We reactivate the sludge. In that, in that respect, your data will be the sludge now. Um, and then here, reactivation again. I like this word and because this really is what you do. And now this is the socialist message, but it, it rings true. This, this data that we produce are collective property and not the byproduct of publication. It's the other way around. The publication is the byproduct of the data. And your data lives longer than you do. So, I think what people should really start doing is thinking about the opportunities we create with this open science that is coming anyway. I mean, the debate about open science is, I think, is past us. What, is, what should be the debate is, what can we do? And you can start by thinking, what can I do with open science? What can I study? What can I learn? What opportunities now present themselves if all the data, let's start with your own field, are, were available online? And then once you've You've gotten used to that, you can leave this out. You say all the data from anywhere is available online. What can you do when all the code in the world is online and all the algorithms are out there? What can you do when all the publications are open access? Right? So these kind of questions we should ask ourselves. Because most of these opportunities are not like typical research, little incremental steps. They change the way we do stuff. And they can be quite revolutionary. So I'm really looking forward to the next few years. And finally, I'll, I'll end with this nice picture. I never understood this, right? Dragons always get lots of gold, and then they go and sleep on it. There is no point. Why on the earth? Why bother getting the gold, right? So you don't want to be like this guy. Yeah? But you want to be like this guy, who tries to do something original with that gold. And the metaphor actually is imperfect. And you know, the only thing that's imperfect about the metaphor is that this pile of gold is finite, but the data is not. When I use the data, I do not use it up. There is still data for you to use and for anybody else to use. Okay? So data is in a way infinite. It's an infinite treasure. And we don't need dragons, we need more hobbits. Thank you. With Sentinel Electron, is that? Sorry, Sorry did I work with? Sentinel Electron, like, uh, um, the standardization of the European office. Actually, we try to do the grassroots community standards first. So we try to ask the scientists in the field what they want for, uh, for their standards, and we build it from the community. So we don't start from a regulatory body downwards. We start from the grassroots up. It's a, it's a different process. Okay, and uh, is there any work on that? Because if you can publish to our to every researcher that standards are going to be published or going to be made for open data and for, uh, for publication, that would be helping them just to close the gap between interpretation and data we can interpret. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, is, there is there any work on this? Is this already accessible? Is it published in a published? Some good work. Is it accessible? The standards you mean? What is the work you've been doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, so you you look, if you look at the standardization office and not regulation, but the standardization office, um, you've got European uh, standards, you've got technical reports, you've got technical specification. Is there something similar that you're working on? So the, the process that we set up, it's, it's worldwide, right? So the, because it's a community and we just use the sub migration community across the world. And then everything, but everything is done in the open online. So everybody can see everything. Everybody can participate in the meetings, which are free to participate in, like this one. Everybody can uh, register to the mailing lists. Everybody can look at all the standards. And we, we have two cycles of peer review for each standard that comes out. There's, a, there's invited peer review, it's like in the classical publishing model. But there's also a period of 60 days where the standards are online, and anybody can comment on the standards. So we find a lot of links to dubious websites that are generated by bots, but we also get reasonable comments from people. That, that could be anything, anyone and anything. All the standards are licensed under very permissive open licenses, of course, and they're all in the public domain all the time. Yeah, that's, that's fundamental, of course. Otherwise, and the whole process is open to anyone interested, which makes it slow. I'll admit that, because people come in after two years of work and they ask the same question that was asked two years ago and resolved. That's we have to re-explain, but fair enough. It's the slow way, but it's, it's the good way. And the nice thing is because of the road grassroots, a lot of people will be working with the standards, will have invested in the standards, and will adopt them. Slightly better than a top-down way of doing it, where somebody comes in and says, now you have to follow this standard. Which for research is extremely difficult to get across. Yeah. Other questions? Otherwise, I have one because you mentioned you already made data management plans and work with them. Uh, can you say a little bit about your experience with data management plans and how much effort it takes and what can we do as a mayor, for example, to help people like you? Yeah. So the data management plan, I haven't yet made it. I'm in the process of making one. Right? So it's, it's very early days. However, I, I've taken uh, I've taken many notes about this. I've read a lot of the documentation. I came across the website that exists in the UK to make these data management plans. And while it looks deceptively simple with the four key questions, and as soon as I started talking to my project partners about this at the kickoff meeting, we actually had it uh, last month. Um, a lot of really annoying issues started cropping up. And the main annoying thing is because I'm in the life sciences, we work with patients. And so a lot of the data is patient-derived. And then you open up a, uh, a Pandora's box of problems. Because every nation has different rules. And there are many nations, of course, in these EU projects. And the, the, the privacy rules are different, and the ethics rules are different. And so the bottom line is that we'll probably have to say that, at least for now, all the patient data will never be public. It will probably never even leave the hospital. So people wanting to analyze it have to go to the hospital. And this is really annoying. When it comes to all the other stuff, like the standards and, and real research data that comes from cell lines or something where there's no, no such issues, then it's actually really simple. Because we, but we are lucky, we have a field where standards are known, repositories are known. So we will say we will use this standard, this repository, uh, curation is done in the repository, and this and this way. I mean, this is trivial. I can, I can write that in, in, in half an hour. The problem is really when we get to the data that is on some sort of protection by other rules, and especially this patient-derived data, which is extremely difficult to work with because the rules are very complex. Um, now, of course, uh, if Caroline, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the whole purpose of having a data management plan is to think about these things and, and write down what you think about it. And of course, not everything can be open to this. It's logical. It's a question of thinking about it and writing it down. Is the data management plan also an incentive to do that? Um, yes, but it's, it certainly is. Um, for, but not so much for me, because I, for me it's a spinal cord reflex now. But I've noticed that when I discussed it with my project partners, they really started thinking about this. And, and I know for sure um, that a lot of the partners will now share more data, because we will have this data management plan, and because I will whip them into doing it, than they otherwise would do. Not because they are unwilling to share their data, but because it's that additional bit of effort, and this will help us. So I think it's actually very good that there is a data management plan, and I know from the UK founders they've had this for a while now, where people actually commit to something. The only problem is that it's sometimes hard to, to enforce this after the money has been spent. The good thing in the EC, it has to be there at six months. Which is very early on, 
and you can get a really bad evaluation and a midterm evaluation if you don't follow up on this at least a little bit. Now it's a pilot, I'm sure they will not really, you know, they will not uh, uh, do scorched earth politics on this in the first round. But it makes sense, it's a very good step. Um, and I think the, the main issue I have with this patient data stuff is not so much with the data management plan, but the problem I have is that um, I'm frustrated. I would love to share some of that data in certain ways, but right now the uh, knee-jerk reaction in most nations, and Belgium is particularly knee-jerk about this, is that anything that smells like as if it could potentially give any problem at any point in the future, it has to be locked down and safe behind 20 barriers uh, in a time when people post everything on Facebook. But, you know. um, but, so, but that's a completely different thing. Thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you again, uh, Leonard. Until uh, well, it's now yeah, until five past eleven. Okay, see you back in twenty minutes.